and I was on the swim team. And my swim captain had come up to me and asked if I wanted a job as a lifeguard. Um, so from there, I worked for the Milwaukee Lifeguard Corps. Um, and then from there, I went to school to be an EMT basic. After completing that course, I then worked as a EMT on a private ambulance in Milwaukee. Um, you tell us a little bit about what you had to do to complete that course? So EMT basic is, uh, I believe, 160, maybe 180 hours. Essentially, that comes to a couple days a week out of a, out of a semester. Uh, and then following that, after a successful completion of the coursework at the college, um, you then take two nationally uh, registered um, courses, or tests, I should say. Um, one is a psychomotor course, um, so that's a psychomotor course, uh, test, exam. Um, and that's essentially the hands-on technical skills. And then there's a cognitive exam, um, and it is uh, a computerized exam where you take multiple choice questions in various fields of uh, pre-emergency uh, hospital care. Was those two classes that you described, were those necessary to finish up the EMT basic program? Correct. And was there anything else you needed to do to finish up that program? Um, apart from submitting an application to be licensed through the state, um, that's essentially it. Are you familiar with the requirements in order to become an EMT in Wisconsin? I am. What are those requirements? Um, so just to recap, uh, finishing some sort of college coursework, whether it's an EMT basic, um, or if you go on for an advanced EMT or an EMT paramedic. So the coursework, the coursework through the accredited college is the first thing. And then following that is the, uh, like I said, the two uh, national uh, registry of EMT or emergency medical technicians uh, exams that you take once you complete those and pass them. Um, then you submit an application to whatever jurisdiction that you'll be working in. Um, because while you might learn you know, this much, you're only able to potentially do this much given local protocols and, and laws. Did you complete all of that yourself? I did. Did you obtain a certification from the state of Wisconsin to be an EMT? I did. And did you put that into practice? I did. How so? Um, like I mentioned before, I worked for a private ambulance in Milwaukee uh, for a number of years. Did you continue on in uh, the field uh, to get more advanced training or more advanced certification after that? I did. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so when I was working uh, as an EMT basic, um, I decided that I really enjoyed it. Um, and I wanted to advance my knowledge, my expertise, my experiences. <clears throat> and I went back to school to uh, Waukesha uh, County Technical College. And this is where I took the EMT paramedic course. Can you tell us about that course? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, the EMT paramedic course, um, I guess a, a quantitative way to uh, differentiate the two. EMT basic is about 180 hours of class time. And EMT paramedic is about 1,600. Um, so for the specific course that I took at Waukesha County Technical College, uh, I took 34 credits in a semester. Uh, the way that this course was structured is um, you would take a morning class, a morning class, and an afternoon class. Um, and this would go on for the entire semester. Um, these classes would be, for example, one of the first two courses that I took was one course specific in treating trauma and then uh, medical emergencies. So there is a difference between those two. So morning class, afternoon class. And then at the end of two weeks, in this kind of condensed, really fast-paced, really hard-hitting course, courses, you would then take the exam for those. And then as long as you passed with a B or higher, you were then essentially able to move on to the next segment. So if at any point in this program you were to fail a course, say you failed your morning class halfway through, but you passed your afternoon class, you would have to wait for the next uh, academic semester to, to um, to, to go back, to reattend. Were you able to make it through that entire program? I was. Is that true for everybody else in your class? It is not. What was the kind of the dropout rate, if, if you will? Um, from what I remember, we had about 25 to 30 uh, students. It uh, was one of maybe 10 that passed. Once you finished all of that coursework, did you get any new license or certification? I did. And what was that called? 
Uh, that is the EMT paramedic certification. Is that from the state of Wisconsin? That is. Do you remember approximately when you obtained that? That would have been um, 2014, I want to say. Can you help us understand the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? Uh, yes, I can. Um, the, like I said, a quantitative way to delineate the two is the amount of coursework. Um, a simpler way that I like to put it to people is uh, paramedics can put new holes in people. So some of the, sorry, would you like to go ahead? Some of the things, for example, are administering IV medications, so knowing how to start an IV. Um, also, <clears throat> cardiocentesis, sorry, cardiocentesis, um, which is essentially a life-saving uh, maneuver which involves um, extracting fluid from the heart. Um, there's also a great deal of pharmacology knowledge that needs to be known. For example, uh, EMTs, EMT basics, can administer six different kinds of medications. Paramedics, and again, it depends on the jurisdiction that you're working in, but nationally, uh, you're taught a little over 50 different kinds of medications. And that's ju not just names, but it's indications, contraindications, or when to use it, when to not use it, um, dosages, which can be dependent on weights, age, um, and then there's also um, just the general knowledge that's known. So while there are a lot more technical skills that you learn and pharmacology and things like that, it's also being able to identify and properly assess. After you obtained your certification as a paramedic, did you uh, work in that field? I did. Can you tell us about that? Um, like I said, I had been previously employed on a private ambulance uh, as an EMT basic. I then continued to work um, on a private ambulance as an EMT paramedic. Did you ever do any of that work here in Kenosha? In Kenosha, no, but in Racine. Um, I worked for Erickson Ambulance for a time. During your time working as a paramedic with that private ambulance company, what sort of uh, medical emergencies did you have to respond to? Um, so Erickson Ambulance does um, primarily, uh, well, I think almost exclusively, what's called inter-facility transports. Um, so it's not like when somebody calls 911, Erickson Ambulance is the one to respond. Um, versus like in Milwaukee, um, there's a, essentially the, these, these calls are shared with the fire department and private ambulances. So the private ambulances kind of back up the firefighters. Um, but specifically for Erickson Ambulance and Racine, when I worked as an EMT paramedic, um, our general patient population were elderly people. Um, so this was, I mean, a, a, range, a, a range of emergencies, anywhere from diabetic issues to uh, potentially um, mental health issues. There's always the, the chance and, um, or the chance of trauma, um, say somebody falls. Um, cardiac issues are also uh, a, a big, well, the, <clears throat> A more, um, I guess, ubiquitous thing with with uh, the geriatric. Uh, sorry, uh, cardiovascular emergencies are a lot more common given the age of geriatric patients. Do you remember approximately how long you worked as a paramedic? <clears throat> I'd say about a year. Were there ever times in which you had to deal with someone suffering from a gunshot wound? Yes, I have. What was that like? It's difficult. Um, gunshots can be very traumatic. Uh, and I mean traumatic in the sense of the, the physiology of what it can do to the body. Obviously, there are you know, numerous factors that go into it, the size of the, the caliber, where the person's shot, how many times. Um, and when you are practicing in school, it is much different from when you actually go and put your hands on somebody who is, is bleeding. Um, there's <laughs> lots of blood, um, screaming. Generally speaking, there's somebody there that's frantic. So that not only are you having to focus on the patient, but you have to deal with the surrounding situation, which can be potentially like I said, a frantic family member, say if it's an accident or uh, self-inflicted. Um, but also, it can be a dangerous situation to go into because, generally speaking, I mean, you, you shoot people to hurt them. 
and there's always that potential of continued on-scene violence. Um, so it can be very hectic. Um, it definitely doesn't get easier the more you do it. Uh, maybe going through the motions, um, you know, going through your, your mental checklist of things that you need to, need to do. Um, but it definitely doesn't get easier watching that, hearing that. Since you obtained your paramedic certification from the state of Wisconsin, have you continued your education in that field? I have. Can you tell us about that? Um, I went to school to, uh, for outdoor education. And naturally through that field, um, you are finding yourself in remote areas where there is going to be some form of delayed care, meaning, <clears throat> meaning that you are unable to get to a hospital within an hour. Um, and that's commonly referred to as the golden hour, specifically with uh, trauma patients. Uh, I <clears throat> then took a uh, wildland firefighter course, uh, which I did complete. And then I also took uh, what's called wilderness first responder, which is the pretty, um, it's essentially the industry standard for uh, people who work in uh, the outdoor industry. Um, yeah. Have you uh, worked in the outdoor industry, as you say? I have. What kind of work have you done? My first job uh, in the outdoor industry was working as a sea kayak guide in the Apostle Islands. Um, a sea kayak guide in the Apostle Islands? Is that right? Correct. Okay. Go ahead. Um, and then from there, um, naturally through schooling and opportunities, I primarily worked with children, um, middle school age. And also from there, I was a, um, or am an American Canoe Association uh, sea kayaking instructor. So I actually teach people how to effectively sea kayak. Um, bit of context, uh, specifically for where I worked in the Apostle Islands, Lake Superior is very cold get very windy, which means very wavy, so it's maybe just a little bit more intense than maybe paddling around your lake cabin. Yeah. Are you continuing your studies today? I am. And how close are you to finishing those up? I have one more class that I need to complete to receive my bachelor's uh, in outdoor education. I want to turn your attention, Mr. Grosskreutz, to the, the summer of the year 2020. Um, and we're going to lead up to August 25th. But before that, um, did you spend time that summer uh, attending any protests or demonstrations? I did. Can you tell us about that? After the death of George Floyd, um, I found myself demonstrating in Milwaukee. Uh, this was, I want to say, maybe two days after George Floyd's death. and. I was out um, with a friend of mine who I actually took EMT Basic with, and we were out demonstrating. Um, we were seeing what the scene was like. Um, I'm sorry, seeing what the scene was like. Um, we didn't make signs or anything like that, but we, like I said, we found ourselves down in Milwaukee. Um, and when you say you were demonstrating, what exactly were you doing? <laughs> well, I think. What I was specifically doing was just being in attendance. But I want to make sure we understand what you mean by demonstrating. Mm -hmm. um, were there people damaging property? No. Lighting fires? No. Uh, was there any violent clash with police? No. What time of day, if you recall, were these uh, demonstrations? Um, that specific first one, generally, late morning into late afternoon. Um, so what would other folks be doing at these demonstrations? People would be holding signs. They would be chanting various things, um, driving cars down, down the street. Um, yeah. And you said you initially were there just kind of to see the scene? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, correct. And, and tell us what happened after that. So after walking for a few hours, um, kind of starting to wrap the day up, and all of a sudden somebody starts yelling, medic, medic. Um, 
and I'm walking, like I said, with my friend who I took EMT basic with, and he looks at me and he says, that, that's you. I was like, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> um, and then I came over uh, to a patient who had uh, tripped and fallen over a curb. Uh, my guess is they just weren't paying attention, got their, got their feet caught up. Um, and the patient was, was all right after an assessment, um, advised to go to the hospital. Um, following that, though, I noticed that there was no established or even organized sort of first aid presence at these demonstrations. Um, and from there, uh, I was talking with my friend who I'd taken EMT basic with, and we decided that we were going to offer our services voluntarily. And did you do that? We did. Tell us about that experience. So I had uh, talked to some of the prominent organizers uh, in Milwaukee, and we kind of laid out a, a game plan or you know, uh, how we were going to organize this. Um, essentially, as medics, we decided that we weren't going to be actively uh, participating in any of the demonstrations. Uh, I think there's a, essentially a, a, an ethic code that if you are providing medical care, it, it, you shouldn't necessarily choose a side uh, because everybody has the right to protest or demonstrate, assemble, freedom of speech, but also everybody has the right to do that safely. So very early on, we decided that we weren't going to actively participate uh, in these demonstrations. From there, uh, my friend and I <clears throat> outfitted his uh, pickup truck into a, essentially a, a mobile first aid station. In the time period that followed after that, uh, did you and your friend with this mobile first aid station um, provide medical assistance at these uh, demonstrations? Yes, we did. On um, approximately how many occasions would you say you did that? I think it's re relevant for many reasons. Um, it's establishing his background as a paramedic, uh, which was come, came into play on this particular evening. I think it also is uh, drawing a contrast between him and the defendant. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, overrule the objection on the first ground. How many, approximately how many times would you say you were out there providing medical care at these demonstrations? I would say about 75 days prior to um, August. And during that time period, what sort of uh, medical situations would you assist in? Primarily, um, it was essentially people not taking care of themselves. I mean, it was a hot summer. People weren't hydrating. Uh, people weren't eating. Um, people weren't wearing proper footwear. Um, so I would say it was, by and large, very nothing sort of like medical emergencies. It was very, you know, like, like I said, people not taking care of themselves. So like I said, providing water, providing um, food, um, potentially bandaging, sprained joints like ankles, things like that. You mentioned earlier that you felt sort of an ethical obligation not to pick and choose your, the people you would treat. Um, did you treat anyone who needed it, no matter what their political beliefs were or what side they were on? Yes, absolutely. I want to move to the night of August 25th, 2020. On that particular evening, did you come here to Kenosha? I didn't. Had you been working at your normal job that day? I was. And do you recall approximately what time you left uh, to come down to Kenosha? 7 p.m. Did you travel alone? I did. Were you part of any sort of larger group or organization that was coming to Kenosha that night? I was not. Why did you personally decide to come down here that night? Essentially for the same reasons that I stated earlier. Um, we were all aware of what was happening in the days following Jacob Blake's shooting. Um, people do have a right to demonstrate. Um, I'm no way advocating for property damage or anything like that. But given the, I think we all can agree, chaotic situation, 
of those three days following Jacob Blake's shooting, um, <clears throat> there was certainly a, a propensity for violence, um, or maybe not just violence, but injuries at, at, in general. Um, and so for the same reasons that I stated earlier, I, I, you know, I've, I've delivered patients to uh, freighter down here. I'm familiar with the area, and um, I felt that given my level of experience and knowledge that I could be of assistance to people. When you came down here that night, did you bring any of your own medical supplies? I did. What kind of supplies did you bring with you? Um, brought a tourniquet, um, what's called hemostatic gauze, also commonly called quick clot, um, chest wound seals, um, some gloves, some saline spray. How were you dressed that evening? I had a um, black shirt um, with a uh, Wu-Tang sign on it. It's a, a pretty famous uh, group. Um, I had khaki shorts. I had tennis shoes. And also I had a blue hat um, with large lettering that said paramedic on the, uh, I guess on the front of it. Were you carrying any of your equipment with you? I was. How were you doing that? I had it in um, a, a small backpack. Were you armed? I was. Tell us about that. I believe in the Second Amendment. I am, I am for uh, people's right to, to carry and bear arms. Um, and that night was no different than any other day. Um, it's keys, phone, wallet, gun. Did you have a permit to carry a concealed weapon? I did. Was it in effect on August 25th, 2020? It was not. Had it expired? It had. And you had not renewed it? I had not. When you were having this medical truck in Milwaukee, did you carry a gun then? I did. When you came down here, how did you carry your gun? I had my handgun um, holstered in the small of my back. What type of gun was it? It was a Gen 4 Glock 27, so it is a smaller framed 40 caliber handgun. Was it loaded? It was. Do you recall if there was a round in the chamber? That night, I don't. When you came down here to Kenosha that night with your equipment, etc., did you specifically seek to meet out with any particular person or any group or anything along those lines? No, I did not. So tell us what you did when you first came down here. So after I arrived in Kenosha, um, I parked uh, several blocks away. Um, this is both for safety and protection of my property. Um, I put on my equipment, which is essentially my handgun and my medical supplies. Um, and then I walked towards the courthouse um, from there. Um, things were already, there was already confrontation between demonstrators and the police. Um, and by confrontation, I mean people were throwing water bottles, the police were, uh, shooting pepper balls from the top of the courthouse, that, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then after I arrived, um, I, I assessed the scene, um, and almost immediately I came upon a person who had been somehow, whether it was direct spray or, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a gas formation on or form, um, who was affected by the pepper spray. Um, so immediately following that, I started treating this person um, and then again from there, I, I, I was assessing the situation, um, primarily treating people who were affected by the tear gas, also delegating to other people how to effectively treat that. Um, now, when you say you were delegating, were these people that you knew that, that you were delegating responsibility to? No. So tell us about the delegating process. One instance that I can think of uh, in particular, um, the proper way to treat, well, just to irrigate an eye in general, regardless of what is what is causing you know an issue, um, is you want to start from the nose and then pour out 
the idea behind that is that you know if you have something that's affecting this eye, you pour it this way, then it, that chemical or whatever it is, irritant, can then go into the, the unaffected eye or unaffected eye. <clears throat> so I had um, come across a person who was not properly irrigating the eye, and so that would would have been one of the forms of of delegation, just telling this person, hey, you know. This is the proper way to do it, you know. Whether or not um, they chose to listen to me, that's that's their choice. But again, just trying to provide some some proper knowledge and treatment. Do you recall approximately how many people you uh, gave medical assistance to that night? I don't know the exact number, um, but if you wanted me to estimate, I'd say around ten. Uh, what was the most serious situation that you dealt with? Apart from myself? Yes, as, as a medic treating the, the other folks that were out there. Um, there was an individual, um, a younger patient, who had been shot in the uh, crease of her left arm um, with what we presumed to be a rubber bullet, um, fired from one of the police. and. <clears throat> She had sustained a pretty pretty decent laceration. I mean, there was a pretty good cut from it. So whatever had hit her had some force behind it. Um, so while actually treating a patient with tear gas irritant and then started to hear this young patient scream and that immediately got my attention. Um, and would, would you like me to explain that interaction? You know what, let's pause there for a second. I want to show the jury something. Mr. Grosskreutz, I'm going to play an uh, excerpt of exhibit number 55, and I would like you to, um, uh, when we're done, I'll ask you a couple questions about it, okay? Go ahead. <coughs> Pause the video there for a second. Do you see yourself in that video? I do. Can you help us un uh, identify yourself there? Uh, I would be, uh, you can see the top of my head um, with a blue baseball cap and some white lettering uh, and a black shirt. That is me. Okay. Go ahead. Can you tell us what was shown in that video? Uh, this is me, uh, several, several other individuals uh, who I did not know. Um, the patient laying on the ground and um, what I later found out after um, I had treated the patient, uh, their father. Okay. And was this the individual you mentioned who had a, a laceration to their elbow from a rubber bullet? That is correct. Do you remember where physically you were when you were providing that treatment? Um, this would have been the just across the street of the south uh, east corner of Civic Park. Okay, so basically right out across the square here. Correct. And this was on the night of August 25th? Correct. Okay. Can we go to show exhibit 56, please?
Mr. Grosskreutz, do you recognize what's up on the screen there as exhibit number 56? I do. Can you identify that for us, please? <clears throat> um, it appears to be a news article from the Kenosha News um, depicting myself and the patient uh, in a still of the video that we just previously watched. Your Honor, I would move exhibits 55 and 56 into evidence. Objection. Proceed. While you were out there on the night of August 25th, were you also taking your own video recording of what was going on? I was. Can you tell us about that, please? I can. Um, so essentially when there wasn't a, a medical emergency or somebody seeking assistance, um, I am a uh, ACLU legal observer and I decided that the next best thing that I could do that night um, was just simply record. Was this something where you were just recording it onto your own equipment or was it being shared in any way? It was being recorded from my cell phone but it was through a Facebook live stream. Were you broadcasting live on Facebook while you were doing that? I was. And so that video would have recorded most of the things that you saw and, and places that you went uh, while you were here that evening. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Did there come a time in which you encountered a group of folks uh, that were armed in front of the 59th Street car source location. I did. Can you tell us about that? After the police had moved the demonstrators from the park, uh, they started to form um, a, a line, which they would then advance, moving the demonstrators south down Sheridan Road. So let's say maybe 10, 15 minutes after they, they started clearing the park out uh, and found myself outside of the 59th Street car source. Um, as I walked up, um, one of the first things I had noticed that there were people um, armed with long guns, um, AR-15 type weapons, uh, similar to the defendants, and they had been on the roof. Uh, I recall like three of them, I think, and um, there were also individuals on the ground, similarly dressed, similarly armed. On the ground, I recalled four seeing initially. Um, Do you remember the first time that you observed the defendant that evening? I do. Can you tell us about that? There was an individual um, who I had assumed came from the demonstration. The reason I assume that is because this person was coming from north, traveling southbound. Um, this individual is being supported uh, by two other individuals, kind of like that, uh, if you were to hurt your leg and you needed somebody to, to help you. Um, I had observed this uh, individual um, come closer to the car source as the defendant had been essentially offering medical aid. Um, and then that was the, the first time that uh, I saw the defendant. Do you know what happened with regard to that person who was being supported by other people and the defendants? I only know what I had seen in the moment. I don't know what happened to this person afterwards. But what I observed um, was the defendant offering medical assistance and then this individual being um, carried in a way onto the car source property. I then heard somebody yell, don't let them treat you. And I turned around, um, and I don't remember why exactly I turned around, but then moments later I then turned back facing towards the car source and towards the defendant and towards that individual, and then that individual along with the other two people supporting them were exiting the property. Did you see the defendant provide any treatment to that individual? I did not. Do you remember a time when you were at that location, that car source location, and you, you observed a dumpster out in the middle of the road? I do recall that, yes. What do you remember about that? Um, I 
didn't see how it got there, but it, it was your pretty typical municipal dumpster, um, you know, green with the with the black top. Um, I didn't see anybody actively pushing it. Like I said, I, I didn't even see how it got there. Um, but I, it was probably about a dumpster's length from the the, the curb, uh, which would be in front of car source. Did you see anyone trying to start it on fire? I did not. Can we please uh, bring up the live stream exhibit number 57? at the 5544 mark, please. What we just observed, Mr. Grosskreutz, is that part of the live stream that you recorded that evening? That is. And I noticed there seems to be a little bit of a, a lag in the, in the audio to the video. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Okay. But is that a true and correct copy of what you recorded that night? Apart from the one or two second delay, it is. So this incident here with the dumpster and whatnot, um, were you physically there, right there, a few feet away when all this was going on? I was. And did you observe the people that were around you at that time? I did. On that particular evening, and I, again, I'm going to ask you to try and go back and put yourself in the mindset of that night. When you're out there on the streets that evening, had you ever heard of anyone by the name of Joseph Rosenbaum? No. Had you ever met that person before? Never. Do you recall seeing Joseph Rosenbaum at any point that evening? I do not. In particular, right around the time of this dumpster fire um, in front of 59th Street Car Source, do you recall seeing him around that at any point? I do not. Do you recall hearing anyone make any threats to any of the people at the car source location that if I get you alone, I'm going to kill you or anything along those lines? I do not. Do you recall hearing anyone make any threats to any of those people at that car source location? I do not. You mentioned that the first time you saw the defendant was this person that was limping, being supported by other people. Um, and I know you mentioned that eventually you saw that person walking away. Uh, do you remember any other observations that you made of the defendant when you were at the 59th Street car source? Uh, I do. Can you tell us about that? Um, I took note, like I said, there were four people essentially in, in front of me that I could see, so I took note of what they were wearing, how they were armed. Um, like I said, they were all similarly armed with a, a similar weapon of, from that the defendant used. Um, uh, some of them, uh, especially as you can see in the video, um, had uh, body armor, chest rigs, um, and then uh, I, I, I noted that the defendant was wearing a baseball cap, green shirt, jeans, um, and then also a rifle. At that moment in time, did you have any idea who he was? No. Never met him before? Never. Were there times in which you saw him wearing gloves on his hands? I did. When was that? Um, I recall this being right around this time. 
Um, then I noticed the defendant also wearing uh, blue latex gloves, or maybe dark purple latex gloves that are pretty com I mean, very common <laughs> in a healthcare setting. Did that strike you as unusual? In the moment, no, it did not. Do you wear gloves like that when you treat people? I do. Tell us about the process of putting them on and taking them off. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> the, these gloves that are common throughout all healthcare systems, they're, they're nitrile, um, or they can be latex or non-latex. Um, uh, these gloves are designed to uh, essentially stop anything wet that you don't want on your hands, so like blood or any sort of bodily fluids. The idea is um, it's called body substance isolation. Um, so despite it being a very thin piece of plastic, it's very good at keeping contagions um, off of your hands. So the idea is, um, and also keeping in mind too, that you want to have your hands clean when you're also touching somebody else, um, especially if there's any sort of open wound, um, you want to minimize that potential for contamination or cross-contamination. The idea is that when you come upon a patient, um, obviously if you're able to, wash your hands, some sort of sanitizer, uh, you know, sanitizer, something along those lines, um, and then prior to uh, administering aid or treatment to a patient, and then put these gloves on. Um, and then after treating your patient, there is a, a specific way to uh, remove your gloves that, uh, let's say if there was some sort of fluid um, or contagion on the gloves, there's a proper way to remove them to where you wouldn't get your hands dirty afterwards with whatever it might be on the glove. So when you're working as an EMT or a paramedic, do you typically keep one set of gloves on your hands constantly throughout your shift? Never. Why not? Um, essentially for the, the reasons that I just stated. I mean, if you treat... Sorry, essentially what? Uh, essentially for uh, the reasons that I just previously stated. Um, if you, if you um, treat one patient um, and, and on an ambulance shift, on a 24-hour shift, 48-hour shift, you about, you know, one call every hour and a half. That's a lot of patients that you can see. Doesn't, I mean, that doesn't make sense. That's just not one proper hygiene, too. It's not proper protocol. It would do, be detrimental to your health, every subsequent patient's health, um, and not only from touching or having contact with the patient themselves, but also everything else that you touch. Um, we all know with COVID how easily things can spread. Um, you're touching doorknobs, your face, pens, pencils, equipment, etc. Um. On this particular evening, after you were at the 59th car Street Car Source, do you recall where you went after that? I do. So from the Car Source location here, I um, started walking southbound down Sheridan. Did you wind up at the ultimate gas station at the intersection of 60th and Sheridan? I did. Do you recall what, if anything, you did there? Nothing different than I had previously been doing. So like I explained, when there was no patient essentially to treat, then I started recording. Again, I'm an ACLU legal observer. I thought that was the best way that night that I could provide um, another aspect or another perspective of um, an unbiased account. Um, I mean, video doesn't lie. Um, Yes. So when you were leaving 59th Street, heading down to the Ultimate Gas Station, were you still wearing your hat with paramedic written on it? I was. Did you have anyone come up to you at that particular time and request any sort of medical assistance? No, nobody did. <clears throat> did there come a time in which you heard uh, gunshots? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I was... Uh, slightly south of uh, Ultimate Gas Station. Um, to be very specific, I think it's Ray's Barbershop, which is either the adjacent building or one there over. Um, while I was recording, um, and I had heard a uh, series of gunshots, um, what I determined to be a few blocks south of where I was. What, if anything, did you do? 
Um, I first sat and listened, and then had um, there were people watching my live stream, so I had been narrating essentially what I was seeing, what I was hearing. Um, I'd heard these gunshots. Um, and had commented on them. And then after seeing and hearing people running, well, I should say seeing people running northbound and then hearing people yelling medic, I started running southbound towards uh, what I uh, presumed at the time to be the, the origin of the, of the gunshots. Do you recall how far south you ran? There's a map up on the wall behind you, if that's helpful. From my location, I couldn't have gotten more than a block. Um, so I, uh, in, in reference to this map, um, when I first heard the gunshots, I would have been right about here. And then I traveled southbound and then uh, never made it any more south than about here. The first place, just for the record, I'm going to try and uh, put, the, put that in words. Actually, sorry. Go ahead. Correction. I started here, and I never made it more south than about here. OK. So you indicate you started at, I think it's uh, labeled on the map there on the east side of Sheridan as Boost, Mobile, and Check and Go. Is Correct. that right? Correct. And you indicate there's a Ray's barber shop there also? I believe so, yes. And then from there, you ran south past 61st Street, and you indicated you were somewhere in the middle of uh, the block between 61st and 62nd. Would that be accurate? That's accurate. And what happened when you got down to that location? I had observed uh, people running northbound um, up Sheridan. And again, hearing people yelling for a medic. But then also, I started to hear people yelling that somebody had been shot. So then that confirmed my, my assumption that somebody did, in fact, get shot. Um, it was there that uh, while I was live streaming, I, um, I met or I had contact with, with the defendant. Can we please play exhibit uh, 57, the live, live stream, um, starting at the one hour, 17 minute and 10 second mark? Shots. It sounds like multiple gunshots. People are scattering. Now this is southbound on Sheridan. This is. I was just at 60th. Looks like they even set up a recliner. Oh, 110 percent, bro. Yeah, dude. 100. This is the video you recorded, correct? Correct. And uh, you have told us that you started running from a little bit south of 60th, that gas station, um, down South Sheridan. Is that right? That is right. Were you recording with your phone? I was. Were you holding your phone in your hand while you were running? I was. Okay. Please continue. You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Can you identify that individual on the screen? That is the defendant. Can we rewind 10 seconds and play that again, please? Hey, what are you doing? You 
You shot somebody? Who shot? Can you tell us, I'm going to ask you two separate questions. First of all, going back into that moment, that interaction you just had with the defendant, what did you think at the time he said to you? At the time, I thought that he, the defendant, had said, I'm working with the police. I didn't do anything. Now that you've had a chance to review the video, do you know what he actually says? Yes. What is that? After watching the video, he said, I am going to the police. And did he say anything else? I didn't do anything, is what I make out from. Uh, it, it's hard to hear from the, the muffling, but that's what I make out of it. I want you to try and put yourself back in the frame of that evening when you heard him say something to the effect of, was it, I'm working with the police? Is that right? Correct. What was your reaction to that? I found it odd. And um, very noteworthy. Um, previously in the night, uh, an individual I had recorded, uh, Mr. Balch, um, had described some sort of plan with the police that they were going to um, essentially push demonstrators south down Sheridan and then past the, past the car source lot. And then from there, we're going to uh, essentially retreat or, or back up that line. And Mr. Balch had explained um, that there was some sort of understanding, some sort of plan to whatever extent that is, but that the police were going to push protesters down past the car source. And he said that then uh, the police told him that it was up to the militia members, as they refer to themselves, uh, to deal with them. When you heard the defendant say what you thought was, I'm working with the police, did that bring back that other knowledge, what Mr. Balch had said? Yes. Can we play the video forward just a few more seconds and then I'm going to pause again? Who shot? Hey, stop him! Hey, stop him! It appears to me, Mr. Grosskreutz, that you ran along or jogged along the defendant for a moment when you had that little interaction. Is that fair to say? That is. And then it looks like you kind of let him continue and you turn back south again. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Why did you do that? So you hear me ask the question, who's shot? Who is shot? Um, at that moment, the only thing I was concerned about was finding this person who had been shot or presumably had been shot, um, given that I was still north of where I thought the shots had come from. Instinctually, I turned, you know, did a 180 facing northbound, then turned southbound because I was concerned for whoever might be potentially injured. It appears from the video, though, that you don't go very far before you turn and head back after the defendant. Would that be fair to say? That is fair to say. What changed? I'd seen a, a number of people. Um, running um, northbound um, in the same direction as the defendant. Um, I'd started hearing people saying, he just shot that guy, he just shot somebody. Um, so, yeah. so then you turn around and head back north after the defendant? I wouldn't say after the defendant. Um, Why did you turn around and head back north after you heard these people say these things? With what Mr. Balch had said previously, um, the, essentially the way that these um, self-proclaimed militia members were conducting themselves, the gunshots, uh, people yelling for a medic, my interaction with the defendant, or 
yeah, my interaction with the defendant um, and the, really the lack of information that I had gotten from him and specifically what I had thought I had heard. Then coupled with this group of people um, running northbound, um, I had uh, essentially made an inference or an assumption that um, there could be a potential for somebody getting injured. Um, and any time you bring a firearm into that equation, the stakes are, are much higher um, for both serious injury and, and, and death. Based on all the factors that you just outlined for us, did you feel like your services might, as a medic, might be more needed in the direction the defendant was headed? Correct. What did you do after that? After I had turned around and started running in the same direction as the defendant, uh, again, this, this, I wouldn't say that there was more people joining, but I, more people were then pointing out the defendant, saying that he had just shot somebody, uh, that he's trying to get away, get him, things of, of that nature. And then so again, further inferencing from the things that I heard and experienced, witnessed earlier in the night, I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. And like I had mentioned earlier, anytime you add a firearm into the equation, or it, it, like I said, the, the stakes are so much higher um, for somebody potentially being seriously injured um, or being, being killed. Can we please um, pull up exhibit number five? Exhibit five. This is the BG on the scene video. Let's go ahead and play that. I'll be pausing here in a, in a little bit. <laughs> We just saw you come running into the screen from the right. You're just behind that figure in the white shirt. Um, before this moment, had you drawn your firearm? No. Where was it? Um, like I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I, I keep my pistol uh, holstered uh, in the small of my back. But don't you have it in your hand at this point? I can't see. Uh, okay. Can't see from this video. Did there come a time when you were running that you did pull your gun out? Yes. Why? Again, in the moment, uh, I, I, I thought that the defendant was an active shooter. Having been not too far behind, like you had mentioned, him, just about to come into the, the frame here. Um, I had uh, heard several more gunshots. Um, and again, making inferences, the defendant was the only one with a large caliber rifle. Um, I'd seen an individual um, jump over the defendant. And then the defendant heard two shots. And then from there, I, I had saw another individual um, use a skateboard to hit the defendant um, or hold the defendant. Either way, the individual had made contact with the defendant with his skateboard. And then from there, I heard another shot. And then as we can see in this still, an individual, well, yeah. Okay. I want to back up for a second, Mr. Grosskreutz, because we have other video that shows you pulling your gun out before those shots are fired. Um, so you, do you remember specifically 
were you intending when you pulled your gun out, were you intending to use it? If I had to, um, I, I didn't draw my firearm with a express intent of, of using it, but also being ready if I had to use it. Let's uh, continue the video for a little bit and I'm going to pause here. Let's pause right there. Uh, we've already seen this video. There's an individual on the left uh, who is, uh, had been shot at twice by the defendant. Then the defendant is there on the ground and there's another individual uh, between uh, the defendant and you, uh, Anthony Huber, who has been shot in the chest at this point. Uh, and that individual uh, to the right of Mr. Huber that's sort of crouched over, that's you, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you witness the defendant fire two shots at that man on the left? I did. Did you witness him fire a shot into Mr. Huber's chest? I did. So when you come upon the defendant at this point, do you recall what you were holding in your hands? I do. What, what were you holding? In my right hand, I had my Glock pistol, and in my left hand, I had my uh, cell phone. What was going through your mind at this particular moment? That I was going to die. Let's continue the video for just a second, please. Pause. There's a time in this video when you appear to hold your hands up. Do you know about that? Do you recall that? I do. Why did you do that? <coughs> After Anthony Huber was shot, um, you can see it in the video, I'm not too far behind him. Um, and the defendant had, after murdering Anthony Huber. Uh, the objection is sustained. That whether uh, the death of Anthony Huber was caused by murder or not is for you jurors to decide and not for the witness. So please uh, keep that in mind. That uh, and people, when they're in the court and they're testifying, uh, they can be affected by their emotions, sometimes by their jobs, and uh, and they will for. A, Someone who comes into a physician, for example, with a gunshot wound, may be identified as a victim. And that's the language that they speak in the hospital because the person comes in with a gunshot wound. Here in the court, where the issue is yet to be determined whether someone's a victim or not, and it's to be based on the evidence presented in court, and it's a decision to be made by you jurors, not by a witness, not by the judge, not by the prosecutor or the defense attorney, so uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to strike the comment, which was this witness's view of the subject, and uh, because it carries no weight. It's for you folks to decide. Any question about that? OK, thanks. Go ahead. So you had just seen Mr. Huber get shot. Correct. And so what was going on in your mind? Uh, I was very close to the defendant. Um, and. I, I, I thought there was a high likelihood that I, I would be shot myself. Can we back up and play 10 seconds? Uh, go back 10 seconds, please. Please continue. Pause. At this point in the video, is the defendant pointing his AR-15 at you? Yes, he is. And you have your hands raised in the air at this point? I do. Continue the video, please. Pause. Did you see the defendant do anything with his gun after you put your hands up? I did. What did you see him do? Um, it's a, uh, an action that's uh, typically referred to as uh, re-racking. Um, uh, 
a firearm. Um, so after the defendant had pointed his rifle at me and put my hands up, and then the defendant, um, like I said, did this motion, it's called re-racking, and that's essentially where you take the, the, the slide, uh, which on a Air 15 like that would be on the top, and you pull back, and you pull back, and what that does is, depending on if there was already a <clears throat> already a, uh, a bullet or a round in the chamber, which would mean it would, would be ready to fire, as you can put in a magazine, uh, which where the bullets are held, and the firearm won't be able to fire. But as soon as you then pull the slide back, like on a pistol or on an AR-15 on the top, that then either loads the rifle or the firearm for it to be ready to fire, or if there was already a round previously in the chamber, that then ejects that round or casing, if that round had been spent, um, and then reloads the next bullet into the chamber or the barrel. So after you raised your hands like this, you saw the defendant re-rack the weapon? Correct. What did you think was going to happen? In my experiences and in my inference uh, in that moment, for the defendant had pointed his weapon at me and I had put my hands in the air. Re-racking the weapon, in my mind, meant that the defendant pulled the trigger while my hands were in the air, but the gun didn't fire. So then by re-racking the weapon, I inferred that the defendant wasn't accepting my surrender. Did you feel that he was going to point the gun and shoot at you again? Yes. What did you do then? So after the defendant had re-racked his weapon with the rifle still aimed at me, in that moment, I felt that I, I had to do something to try and prevent myself from being being killed or being shot or killed. Um, and so I decided that the best course of action would be to close the distance between the defendant and I, and then um, you know, from there I, I, I don't know. I mean, if it meant trying what Anthony had just tried, wrestling the gun, Detaining the defendants, I, 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 I don't know, because uh, I never had an opportunity. Um, I do know, though, I was never trying to kill the defendant. It was never, never something that I was trying to do. In that moment, I was trying to preserve my own life. But doing so while also taking the life of another is not something that I'm capable or comfortable in doing that goes against almost a lifelong ethical code that I've lived by in, 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 regards, to, in regards to medicine. Can we back the video up 10 seconds, please? Can we back it up 10 seconds, please? Go ahead. Mr. Grosskreutz, after seeing the defendant shoot at one person at close range twice, shoot at Mr. Huber in the chest once, and having already been told by others in the crowd that he'd previously already shot someone else, and having him point the gun at you, and you're holding your own pistol in your hand, Why didn't you take your own gun 
and shoot the defendant first. Like I said, that's not the kind of person that I am. That's not why I was out there. That's not why I was out there for 75 days prior to that. Why I spent up until that point, <laughs> spent my time, my money, my education, providing care for people. That's not, it's not who I am. And definitely not somebody that I would want to become. And in that moment, I thought it, it would, I tried to attempt a, 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 a non-lethal way to end that interaction. When the defendant shot you, where were you hit? I was hit in my right bicep. <clears throat> what kind of damage did that do? Um, I effectively lost a, a large majority of my right bicep. Can we please play Exhibit 58? Before we do this, I do want to let everyone know that this is going to be a very graphic. Uh, exhibit, um, what does Exhibit 58 show? Uh, myself, after um, being shot by the defendant. Are you still holding your Glock in this picture? I am. Had you fired your Glock at all that night, at any point? No. Can we please show exhibit number 59? Can you describe what this picture shows, Mr. Grosskreutz? This is me probably 30 seconds after I was shot by the defendant. Uh, you see who I believe to be Mr. Lukowski on the right of the screen. Uh, me in the center with the blue paramedic hat. Right above my hat is Mr. Balch, I believe. And then to the left of me, uh, unfortunately I don't know who the two individuals, uh, who you can't see their faces are, but then um, that is a uh, person I came to know as uh, CJ Halliburton, who was also live streaming that night, and him, myself, and uh, Mr. Lukowski are, um, Mr. Halliburton is applying uh, a tourniquet to my right bicep ball, uh, Mr. Lukowski and myself are um, trying to instruct Mr. Halliburton on the use and application of the tourniquet. Can we please play Exhibit 60?
we're coming out to you. I got right for a bear cat. We're coming out to you. Your Honor, I would move exhibits 58, 59, and 60 into evidence. Objection. Receive. Would this be a good time for a break, Your Honor? It is. Uh, Please don't talk about the case during the break. Read, watch, or listen to any of the account of the trial. Uh, we'll see you in a little bit.